advice alongside Stephen Woods, Annie and Elston, and Gwen and Chris. Here's your host, Ben Higgins. And welcome back in. We got a pretty full house today for our San Diego Padres Roundtable presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. The pizza is here. Let's introduce our cast of characters today. I am Ben Higgins. You just heard uh, Ben and Woods in the morning, 6 to 10 a.m. We have Annie and Elston. This is a uh, time where you usually hear them in the middle of the day, but Annie Heilbrunn is here. Good morning, Annie. Good morning, Ben. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everybody. Craig Elston is with us. Check, check. Right here. And then we've got our afternoon crew of Gwen and Chris, Tony Gwynn Jr. It's good to see you today. You missed our first round table, but here you are. <laughs> I mean, up, you had an excuse. You? I think you were in Korea or flying like to Korea. I was, I was a little ways away. <laughs> last time. And we've got Chris Ello here on the other side of the room from me. Hello, Chris. I just want to say that everybody's got a uh, laptop computer. I brought a piece of paper with some notes on <laughs> old it. Old school. Still old, old school. school. <laughs> yeah. The old, uh, the old newspaper writing days. I actually got a pen bad. and wrote some stuff down. I know that's weird. Maybe it'll help you. Maybe you won't. So the Padres uh, at this uh, at this juncture, four and five through the first nine games of the season, basically a week plus the two games in South Korea. And let's just start and go around and just give some initial thoughts on what you've seen from the San Diego Padres. Let's start over there with Chris Ello today and we'll work our way around the room. But just kind of your your initial impressions of the Padres through the first nine games of the season, Chris? Well, I'm glad they won yesterday because otherwise my initial thoughts may not be as uplifting as they are. Um, I, I think, that, you know, I'm liking what I'm seeing right now. Um, I, I the, the one thing that's a real problem is the pitching in the bullpen, and I don't expect that to continue to be a problem. So as long as they can score runs and, uh, you know, manufacture runs like they did yesterday when they were able to get a win despite going 0 for 11 with runners in scoring position, you know, I think uh, I think it's all right. I, I think that there are some holes, there's some question marks, and we're going to have to see how those all play out. But it's much too early to make a, you know, an, a, a total, you know, understanding of exactly what they have until we see another, you know, month or so of baseball. I but don't. I, I'm a, I'm all right so far. I don't disagree with you, but you use the e word, which is kind of a problematic word for Padres fans. Greg early. It's still early because well, we, we heard that a lot last year and then it became not early. And then all of a sudden, nothing really changed until it was too late. It is impossible to evaluate a team after nine games of a season. If this is this is simply first impressions, walking through the door, saying hi and having a brief chat and, and seeing a little bit from the team. But this is what we have to work with right now. So your first impressions of the 2024 Padres. Well, I don't think it's a team that's played to their identity yet because the Padres 2024 identity seems to me needs to be an elite run prevention team, a team that has great starting pitching, that has great defense and is able to shut down top level offenses when they are right on a given night. And yesterday was the first time this season the Padres allowed fewer than four runs in a game. It had been four and above every single game. So that's not sustainable. And I don't, just like Chris, I don't think it will sustain that way. I think this team starting rotation, hopefully we just saw it with you and Joe, and it's going to roll through the weekend that these guys are finding their feet. And I think when they do, this team will find its identity. Tony, you're closer to this than than any of us with the team in Korea. Now back here through the first nine games, have you seen anything that makes you say, all right, I'm, I'm noticing stuff that is different from last season? Uh, without a doubt. And that, is all in the offensive end. That's the situational baseball that they clearly have had discussions about prior to spring training, during spring training. And I think for the most part, they've executed at a much higher level offensively, despite you can make the argument not having as potent of, a, of an offense. And uh, that's a credit to, to Victor Rodriguez and what he's preached from the onset, from the time he got the job uh, of what he thought this offense needed to look like. He, he has talked about a Petco Park offense, and that shouldn't be unfamiliar to Padre fans. I know we've been lost in the sauce over the past three, four years with the big boppers we had, but the offensive that, that have had success in this building have been the type that are, you know, left center to right center on a line. And you're starting to see some of that. Now, I think everybody is noticing the pitching hasn't lived up to Bill yet, but 
this is an incomplete. You know, I, I need everybody to get over their PTSD of of last year's season and, and it being early and it just dragging on. You just can't evaluate a team nine games into the season. So um, I, there are some things that I think make me hopeful in terms of the offensive side. I, I have very little doubt about the pitching and, and will that improve over time. I, I kind of like your PTSD analogy because we all are a bit scarred from, <laughs> no from last season. And, you know, part of the early season here, Annie, is getting over that because this is a different season. It's a different team. Yeah, some of the – a lot of the faces are the same, but this is a completely different season. And I thought Wednesday's win, 3-2 to two over the Cardinals, is a perfect game to get over that PTSD because Potters did a lot of the same things they did last year. They went 0-11 with runners yeah. in scoring <laughs> position. They failed to tack on against a pitcher that was struggling. They went a few innings without doing anything offensively. We saw that a ton last year, but there was one big difference. They lost almost all of those games last year, and they won it this time around. So, so Annie, give us some of your thoughts here uh, on the early season differences and what you've seen. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. It's hard to assess, obviously, this early in, but you have seen a good group of cohesive together players who seem to have a good idea of what their expectations are for this year and how they're going to go out there and play. And the more that they get those kinds of wins that they had yesterday, where it seems a little improbable, you're not sure which way it's going to go. Like you said, they could have extended the gap offensively a few times right but you you squeak out that win and it helps you prove to yourself that like okay we can do this and now we're going to go out there we're going to be even more aggressive i've loved that we're seeing production from the bottom of the order yeah. that we're seeing guys um like campusano like even jerks and profar a tyler wade at times right like just doing really good things offensively and defensively smart base running good by Higashioka yesterday, of course. So some a little bit of um, early depth that might be helpful for this team. And then once their front of the lineup or their top of the lineup really starts getting themselves going, because I don't even think like Manny is at all where he's going to be for the year. You know, I think we're going to see some some good balance there. So our 97.3 The Fan Padres Roundtable presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. And it's also the first week for a new skipper uh, with Mike Schilt. And just like a anything you can't fully evaluate yet, I thought it was interesting uh, when the Padres lost on Tuesday, they fell to, to three and five and I could sense the fan base starting to panic. Uh, Mike Schultz was very positive. He came out even after the loss, he came out in that game and said, I really love what we're doing. I'm seeing improvements in the areas that I want to see improvements in. Uh, Tony, well, let me start here with you. When Mike Schilt says those, do you, do you believe him? Is he trying to talk it into existence or are you really seeing those those improvements, and do you think Mike Schultz is the right guy for this job so far? I'll start the last question. Yes, I do think he's the right man for the job. I do believe in it. And if you've been around Mike Schultz at all, um, that is par for the course. Like, he is a, a, a positive person by nature. Um, I think part of what makes him unique is that he's cut his teeth really at a developmental level. So there is a certain type of communication skills you have to have when you're trying to develop young men that are, you know, trying to be big leaguers. And he kind of has carried that with him. And I think that's what makes him a, a unique manager because, you know, he doesn't have some of the credentials that some of these other managers have across the league. He didn't play at the big league level. Um, and, and a lot of times that's problematic in this position. But for him, guys recognize immediately that there's a care about, him and about what he's talking about and i 100 percent believe him because I, i've had conversations with him before spring training about where he wanted to see improvement and it, it will, from watching from the level i get to watch at it is it is obvious that there has been conversation and that there has been um actual work done to improve in the areas that they struggled so badly last has year. It, does anyone agree with mike schilt has surprised me a bit i mean we knew what we had heard about Mike Schilt, that he attention to detail, baseball lifer. And I think you get kind of a certain impression in your mind of what the personality of that person is going to be. Now, they're going to be very, you know, Buck Showalt, kind of almost militaristic. Mm. It, and he hasn't been like that. He's actually very relaxed and, and loose. And, and he's got a, kind of got a lighter touch than I'd expect for a guy. Craig, I mean, with the attention to detail that he has, he also kind of brings a very light 
touch to the managerial role. And that could be born of his age, you know, the wisdom accrued from doing this one time and then being out. A lot of times, I think everyone, when you have success, you experience a growth up a chart, you get to a job you want to be in, and then you're not in that job anymore. That can be a point where you start to really reflect on who you are as a person, how you interact with other people. And I, I've, it's weird to say for a guy who's on a two-year deal, which usually means win now, uh, but there's almost a serenity to what Mike Schilt has been doing, that he feels comfortable in his own skin, in his own shoes. He feels like now he's like authentically himself in the job. And so far, 10 of 10, no notes for Mike Schilt. He has been everything you could ask for and more. Yeah, and he seems, um, I think Craig, he seems patient. He's not he's not feeling the pressure like you might expect to just win instantly. And Hey, we better, we better get out to a really hot start or everyone's going to panic. seems like a patient guy who understands that this is a process and there's going to be some time that needs to be taken for the process to fully play out, but not too worried about like his own future. He seems like he really cares about just the players and the team and the organization. He, caring is the right word for him. And I think it's so important to emphasize what Tony said he didn't play professionally. I'm sorry, he didn't play in the majors, right. you know, as, as, a, as a player. And really, you don't see managers who haven't done that. And so for him to, to be able to do that and still have the respect of his players, and it helps, of course, that he had the success that he did with St. Louis so that they, he's got something to stand on there. And then obviously with their, their system altogether and the minors, um, it says a lot about him and the ability of him to get through to some of these players who are looking for that in their manager and want to know that you know the game and that you know what they're going through. And he's a competitive softie. Yeah. So like the thing about Mike Schill, <laughs> I like that competitive he's softie. softie. Like he's like last night, swore and crow zone and he wants you know he gives love i think it's important for his players to know that he is backing them you know at publicly and pr privately but then he's super competitive yeah. like behind the scenes man this guy is like let's go out and bleep and win you know i know uh chris you're some of a, a somewhat of a traditionalist when it comes to to baseball and the in the way the game is played one thing we've seen from mike schilt the exact same top six in his lineup all wild. nine <laughs> games. I mean, that's almost unheard of in baseball nowadays with matchups and lefty righty and splits. They, they teams change it so often now. Yeah. He's put his backup catcher and he's changed his, uh, his third baseman a couple of times based on the matchups and given Jackson Merrill a couple of days off. But, uh, the idea of actually having a consistent top of the order, ha have you liked what you've seen from Mike Schilt when it comes to lineup construction? Uh, yeah, I do. I wish I was still doing the pregame show so I could uh, have a little heads up on what the lineup's going to be. When I used to do the pregame show, they didn't give us lineups until like two minutes before the game, and it was different every night. So I'm 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 thrilled with what he's doing. He he's he's got everybody feeling very comfortable, and, and I think you know that's that's the 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 secret of his success. He's funny. I mean, I I didn't think uh, any manager could be as comical as Mike Schilt is. I mean, he's like a one, one liner after another from time to time, but I think his main goal is to put everybody in the best position to be successful, yeah. which is what every manager's goal is. But I think he wants them in a position where they're also very comfortable and, you know, putting them in the same spot in the lineup is one way to do that. And also being relaxed as a, as a leader is another way to do that. And I think he's, uh, he's been successful on both fronts and, you know, all you need to do is look at the manager of the year balloting. Uh, every year that he's been a manager, he's gotten at least one vote. And he won it, right? So uh, this guy, you know, he's doing a pretty good job, and I'm not surprised about that. I, I, I Yeah, I was going to say real quick, I, I think one of the things that, you know, should be pointed out is sometimes not having all the weapons that you that we had last year can be a good thing. I, you can't really shuffle this lineup in the way that you could shuffle around last year's lineup, you know, because yeah. I think the pieces fit a little bit better. And so you're going to see that top six ran out there uh, mm -hmm. as much as possible. I, I've loved the fact that they have been some continuity in the spots for the first nine games of the season. I mean, yeah. growing up, I mean, you, you think of like when your dad played, I mean, sometimes he'd, he'd bat third in a season or sometimes he'd bat second, but he was pretty much there the entire right. year. I mean, right. win, win, crock. I mean, you can think of years <laughs> where it didn't change at all. Now, right. by the time you played, you know, they start managers started looking more at matchups and in and, and different uh combinations. Yeah. But as a as a player, 
knowing kind of before you even show up to the ballpark that you know where you're going to hit, you know where you're going to be. Is that a valuable asset as Absolutely. a player? Absolutely. And now don't get it. Don't get me wrong. I think guys recognize when there is a shuffling going on, there's usually a reason for it. It's usually someone's not going well. The whole lineup's not going well. And so you respect the fact that, all right, my manager's trying to figure out something. And so you just go with the flow in most cases. But when you have a team that you can put the lineup, the same way every single time or most of the time there is some peace knowing who's in front of you who's behind you how that has set up throughout the course of the season you start to you know players work best when there's some you know consistency right and so you get to see how innings unfold when you got bogey at the top and and toddy at bat and second if you're hitting third or fourth you know how those guys conduct an at-bat. You know what you're going to be getting a lot of the times. And I just think it it it, it sets you up to have more success. All right, I need someone to push back a little bit. Uh, maybe it'll be Craig here. He's wearing the How to Bunt Don't Hit a Dinger shirt. So <laughs> I, I, yeah, you, you know, know he'd be sitting next to You know Jonah, Craig believes bad. in some of the modern matchups and numbers. Is it possible that the best order is always the same six or – if you've got a lefty versus a righty, you got a hard thrower versus a soft thrower, you got a guy who dominates a certain pitcher in their historic matchup, should they always be in the same spot? Or could Mike Schilt be putting together better lineups based on who they're facing on a given day? He has platooned. He he has had three platoons in his lineup. So I, I would suggest he's already done that because Rosario and Wade slash Polly have alternated. Uh, Zokar has alternated with Merrill, right? Um I guess that's two. So am I forgetting one? No, I think that's it. Nonetheless, he's he's had those flips in the line. Yeah, well, I mean, in that's a classic starter yeah, back. Right. Right. So I think he's doing that lefty righty. And I think right now, kind of speaking to Tony's point earlier, the players he has are generally two way players. You know, Jake's a two way player. Fernando's a two way player and, and on down the line. So there are some guys that you want to hard platoon. Right. If you had. I'll keep speaking it into existence. If you had Brandon Belt on the team, for example, you would platoon him usually. Probably you'd have a right-hander in the DH spot when a lefty was up. And I think Schilt will continue to do that. Now, the only thing I would say in terms of pushback, I, I'd like to see one change in this lineup because I think Hassan Kim is a great leadoff hitter. And I think we're losing a couple of the things that make him great by batting him fifth, the number one being the opportunity to run. You rarely get to run in that five spot. You're up with two outs and a guy on, or you're in the middle of a lineup. You're blocked because somebody is in front of you. Uh, and I think Xander is the kind of hitter who can drive in those runs out of the five spot. But I think that Ha Sung has a great batter's eye and could give you a little bit more walks at the top of the order and could give you some speed at the top of the order that you don't want to ask Xander Bogarts to do. Now, Xander traditionally is a guy who'll give you some extra base hits this year. It's been all singles for Xander and uh, he does have the tendency to hit ground balls, which can turn into to double plays. Uh, he he's, he's done a pretty decent job getting on base though, from the leadoff spot as well. Um, and let, let, let me ask you, Annie, because <laughs> is part of this lineup that, that Mike Schild has constructed because he only has Jake Cronenworth as his everyday lefty in the lineup. You have to split him up. He kind of has to be third. Whether whoever the two righties in front right. of him and the two righties behind him are, yeah. you can move around. But Jake kind of has to be third. Otherwise, they'll be vulnerable to those matchups for relievers later in the game because it'll be righty, righty, righty somewhere. Yeah, I would think so. I mean, that's just a smart lineup move, right? Like you've got to put your lefty in there and you've got to make sure that your pitcher isn't seeing all righties coming one through four or whatnot, right, Tony? I mean, I would think that that's just kind of where you need to go. Yeah, I mean, I think – been kind of hit on it, whether it's between one and two or three and four, mm -hmm. there's got to be a breakup somewhere. And, you know, I think right now Mike likes Jake in that three spot. And he's, he's been good there. Yeah. Which puts the, uh, really the pressure on Jake. He's got to have that bounce back season. If yeah. he's going to be relied on in that spot, he's going to need the season that he had a couple of years ago. And guess what? So far, so good. And Mike Schilt uh, waxed poetically about Jake after Wednesday's game. Wanted to just call him out in particular. Had a couple of uh, really sensational defensive plays and, and talked about how he's consistently been hitting the ball hard and taking good swings and really putting together good at-bats. So, you know, Annie, do you feel like do you feel like Jake is back? 
here. I know it's so early again, just like all of our other evaluations. It's yeah. early, <laughs> but are you, are we seeing a different Jake Cronenworth here? Tony's like hiding his Tony's eyes. Like, his he does, eyes. am I'm I like, jinxing things? Is that is that what you're worried about? I, I know how much you love these questions, Eddie. These are like your favorite questions in the world. Uh, yeah. I think Jake looks fantastic. I think he looks like he's calm. He's relaxed at the plate. He talked over the offseason about being more vulnerable, being open to changes with what went on last year. I feel like whatever he worked on in the offseason looks like it's coming to some fruition, at least early on in the season. Um, he's been giving the team what they need, both offensively and defensively. And I, I want to ask Tony, if you don't mind. Ben. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Here's when, my when next question, too. Because... Mike, well, what's your question? Because I want to know what you think. Like, if your manager shouting you out an oppressor, do you does that get back to a player? Do you, do you think that they like that? Like they yeah. want that, right? Everybody, <laughs> every, every, your praise, right? everybody likes that, right? I mean, it, it's 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 teachers no, pad, right? No, everybody on. in here loves to have you know their boss, you know, big them up, especially in a public forum. Yeah, I I was actually going to ask because I can't see the technical differences. Right. I don't study hitting enough. Yeah, I mean, do you that. see something technically that Jake is doing yes. differently? Because in my eyes. It, Looks still looks like Jake. Still <laughs> looks pretty much the same to me. So what is different in your eyes, Tony? From the physical standpoint, um, Jake's hands are higher. And he's kind of, without finding a better word for it, he's kind of trim, trimmed the fat a little bit. So the movement he had where his hands started lower, he just had farther to go. Now he's kind of already closer to that positioning. And I, I spoke to him yesterday, actually, uh, about – you know, the team philosophy, and we kind of got into some of the things he, he's worked on. And I think the main thing for him, and I think Victor Rodriguez, again, deserves a ton of credit for kind of pointing this out. I don't know if you guys remember, spring training, remember he was walking a lot. He was walking like crazy. Um, so he was seeing the ball well, but he wasn't quite, you know, putting the ball in play the way he wanted to. And he said right before the season, Victor came to him with a few drills. We didn't get into the drills, but he said that basically the point was, to help me get ready to the hitting position no matter what, on time, every time. And I think that's, for whatever the drills have been, they have worked because we've seen him as the season got going. He's driving a ball. He's using the entire field. And there's less of the foul balls where they're good pitches to hit and he's fouling them off. He's now putting those in play. And now the defensive side has always been there. It's now Jake is starting to look a lot more like we saw two three years ago and as you said that's going to be you know so important for this ball club the one thing um you're probably not going to get a lot from jake in the third slot though is, is home runs yeah you'll get doubles you'll get some triples but those home runs that traditionally you'd expect your number three hitter to be a, a power guy chris can the padres survive offensively with a number three hitter that only hits 12 home runs or whatever you might expect Jake to hit this year. Well, first of all, I was a little hurt that you did a whole segment of asking for pushback and you didn't ask <laughs> me. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's what Mr. I've known pushback. for doing. Yeah, that's true. Right that's true. Yeah. Basically, I was hired all these years ago to push back. It's going to all these positive people over here. No man. kidding, man. I was just uh, over here waiting. Um, you know, I'm a little concerned about, you know, what they have. I mean, I said it right at the beginning. I said, I think there's some holes that are going to eventually need to be filled. And I think it's just a matter of taking some more time to figure out what those are going to be. And uh, fortunately, there's some players out there that might be able to help them fill those holes. Craig mentioned one already. Uh, I think they can survive with Jake as a number three hitter. I don't know if they can survive with that, plus Jerickson batting sixth all year long. I don't know that Hassan Kim drives in enough runs in the five spot all year long. So I, I do have some concerns about, you know, this lineup. I, I think everybody's going to have to perform at peak efficiency for them to keep scoring the kind of runs that they're going to need to score. So um, I think in a perfect world, Jay can fit anywhere in a lineup because he's a good enough hitter. But I don't know that this is a perfect world right now that the Padres have. I think they need another bat somewhere to round out this offense. And, and, and I hope that they see the same thing because I, I just feel as time goes along, they're going to really wish they had someone else they could they could rely on in the lineup. So 97.3, the Fan Padres Roundtable, presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. Craig, you had another point here? Yeah, I just wanted to back up what Tony's seen with the eye test with what the numbers are saying right now about Jake Cronenworth because I think one of the things that I personally have been concerned about with Jake is 
going to his baseball savant page, which is where I am right now, and seeing his sliders go down year by year by year to the point where things like barrel percentage, hard hit percentage, sweet spot were at their career lows last year. Through nine games, he's right back to where he was in 2020-21. He's yep. hitting the ball as hard as he ever has. His max exit velocity is right in line with his all-time career best numbers. And he's been extremely aggressive so far this year. He actually leads the majors right now in expected batting average at 403. But his walk percentage is a career low. He's at 2.9. He hasn't taken many walks yet. What that tells me is that Pitchers have been challenging. Jake Cronenworth. Of course, they, he's had the, in front of Manny. Right. He's going to get some pitches there. And he is taking advantage of that situation, Tony. Yeah, and that was where, you know, he struggled at last year is being able to take advantage of, of some of the things because mechanically he had some flaws. So it, it's it's good to see him back. Chris is right. But, again, we're, we're talking nine games in the yes, season. Yes, we are. We are. And this is another question that's going to be kind of an eye roll, Tony, for nine <laughs> games into the season. But <laughs> Let me get ready. <laughs> asking, you know, how long are things sustainable? And I'll start with Annie here. Uh, Matt Waldron is the fifth yes. starter. Yeah. And one star, you cannot evaluate pretty much any. You have one bad inning. And, and I made the point this week. All right, if you take a guy out for one bad inning, then take Joe Mus Musgrove out of the starting rotation. Right. Let's take Dylan Cease out of the starting rotation. You're, why would you... Why would you do that to Matt Waldron if you're not going to do it to everybody else? But but Matt doesn't quite have the track record as the other guys. Do you feel like the Padres have the right guy in the fifth slot here? And if if not, what other option would you go with? Well, I think that fifth spot is going to change throughout the year, regardless of even if Matt Waldron does an excellent job to start the season and then perhaps needs a little bit of a reliever or like literally a reliever or a little bit of a break or starts to maybe falter at some point. I think they'll try someone else out in that spot or, or let that spot be flexible at least because it is kind of, it's an unknown spot. You don't really know who's going to fit in there and who's going to work in there, but I think you've got to let Matt Waldron have a chance. Um, he had a weird off season like the rest of this pitching staff, spring training, Korea. Then he came back to San Diego, then went to Arizona with Avila to pitch a little bit, then came back. So just letting him get his footing a little bit in that rotation, I think is important. And then assess, is he also the right guy for it? I think you could definitely see a, a burrito or a Vasquez or even some kind of bullpen configuration, but I don't necessarily, I, I wouldn't just say, oh, he, he's wrong after one start. I, I don't know if this is fair, Tony, but to me, it feels like Matt Waldron as a starter makes sense. Matt Waldron coming in in the seventh inning to try to get three big outs in a tie game doesn't yeah. make a lot of sense to me. Is he in the right role? Do, do you feel like he'll be able to thrive here? I, I, I'm with you on that. I don't. It's hard to see Matt Waldron coming out of the bullpen, other than a long relief scenario. Um, and they have a long reliever right they, now. And they have yeah. one, and, and so I think, um, as Annie said. One thing that was really good about the Dylan Cease deal was it gave the Padres options in that fifth spot because now Michael King slides down, and now you can use a Vasquez, a Brito, a Waldron, an Avila. And listen, all teams, with the exception of a few, have spots like this where they're, they're almost auditioning spots until you get closer to the deadline and you can kind of evaluate what's available, what's not available. And then, you know, those type of spots get addressed uh, for the Padres. I just think they have three, four, you know, and, and who knows what happens with Morty Hone down there. Can he get his his thing together where he's healthy? They have some options that they can use in that fifth spot. Um, Waldron had a rough one. Got to have, have a few more starts. But even I think Andy's right. Even if he had thrown the ball well, this fifth spot, I think, was going to be a revolving door at least early in the season. We saw uh, more knuckleballs from Waldron in that last start than we had seen at any other time. And I was really excited about that until the results weren't there, Craig. I mean, what <laughs> what are your your kind of Waldron thoughts here? Uh, well, on the round as, table? as the primary Waldron apologist on 97.3, <laughs> I'm glad you brought me into the conversation here. Uh, I was, at, you know, as you were, of course, Tony, but a lot of us were at the game, but like watching from the stands, uh, I I saw a lot of things I liked. From Matt Waldron. Let's start with he struck out seven in four innings. Okay. That's not a small amount. And when you say, oh, well, he's getting racked around, he also struck out seven. He had nine swings and misses. He had 19 foul balls. He got to a two strike count on basically every hitter 
that he faced other than Matt Carpenter dropping a bunt on him. He would get to two strikes, and it looked like in the early part of the game, he was both overthrowing the knuckleball with two strikes. They were coming in at 80, 81, 82 instead of 77. Those were the ones that were getting hit. They said afterwards, those are the ones that flattened out, that spun a little bit. Also, I've noticed, Tony, that the second time through, he was taking advantage then of hitters sitting knuckle with two strikes, and he would get that fastball by them at 91 miles an hour yeah. uh, in situations where you go like, oh, my God, 91 in the bigs, you're going to get smashed. Well, not if they're looking 77. 91 looks awful hot. I think there's plenty to build on for Matt Waldron. I think he's an average starter. He has the chance to be an average starter in the bigs. Sometimes average starters give up four runs in yeah. four innings. And that's kind of part of the, the lot of it. But the only other role I'd see for him is one the Padres have never utilized, which is opener. Somebody who could come in, befuddle you for two innings, and then you bring in Brito or Avila or someone else. I think you got to keep rolling him out there. Tony, did you have to face any knuckleballers like oh, Steve yeah. Sparks, your career? I was... faced uh, R.A. Dickey oh. more than my fair share of times. And you know, the knuckleball has kind of evolved a little bit. It used to be like the slow, fluttering type pitch. You see guys, you see Matt, you see R.A. Dickey, all of a sudden they can they can throw it a little bit harder. They can take a little bit off. So it's evolved a little bit. I, I think that's the part that makes it tough for, for Matt is, as you said, he got to two strikes a lot. He was ahead of most of the batters. But being able to put them away is the tough part. What makes it difficult to be a guy with a knuckleball as opposed to a knuckleballer is you're not, well, at least prior to this start, you're not throwing it enough to, to be able to get a guy off your fastball. Right. But in that last start, what you saw was him throw it more gets guys off the fastball, but does he have another pitch to finish guys? Was Craig's point about maybe being amped up first start of the year that that's not good for a knuckleballer. Maybe so. Yeah. Maybe so. Cause the, the two knuckleballs that got hit did weren't good knuckleballs. And I can't recall at any other point seeing him throw like bad knuckleballs. So maybe he was a little bit fired up and, you know, a lot of the traveling he did, all that can, can throw a pitcher off. We'll, we'll give, we, I think he should get a pass for this one. We'll see, see how his next one goes. Chris, you ever dabble in the knuckleball back at San Diego State? I mean, I know you had every other junk ball in the left-handed <laughs> wow. repertoire. Yes, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have changed Shots anybody's fired. perspective. No, I did throw nothing but junk. There. I threw a few on the sidelines, but never won in a game. Um, but I, I, I like Waldron in the five spot, and I think he stays there for a while. And uh, I like him even more now that I watched uh, Brito try to catch Ben Higgins Opening All right, so that was going to be night. my little uh, my seventh inning stretch <laughs> question. I was here. a little Take bit a, upset with Brito little, not, little, not reaching out to get your a little, little break, your and I appreciate that. The field so fast. The, I don't even know. The you. question for everybody is: <laughs> Did my pitch bounce or not? Oh, it, well, it, 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 bounce. Bounce. it did bounce. Well, because every pitch bounces if, it, if, it, if gravity takes effect. Oh, I see. I see. He didn't. I mean, reach someone's got to catch it, or it's going to bounce. That's I true. I felt it. I felt Brito. Essentially, and he brought up some, brought the picture to my head. He did so get he off the field. It, I, I, I will, I will talk to that. I wanted, I wanted to get out there, which, which, no, which leads me to believe you think you bounced it, which well, is why you got off. I the field did so because bad. it got away. I mean, I when, mean in the clip, when, I heard him say, "I bounced it." So I, he was mad. The He's ball like, bounced off Brito? seven people after it hit Johnny Brito. <laughs> so obviously, I thought I must have thrown the worst pitch in history. He's like he's like walking over to the Padres dugout to pick it up. And go, I really thought I threw it pretty well. This is the it was best like thing. Straight. Go back and look at him. And because all the oh, other guys that God. caught, they give him a hug. They send and talk to them. Ben was like he gave Brito a quick hug and then took it. He was like, trying to stand by. You can Where see the you? panic what? settling in on his body Brito there. there are you moment. sure that you didn't throw a knuckleball? Because Brito... <laughs> Brito treated it like the old Bob Euchre story where you wait till it stops rolling and pick it up. Yes, he did. He did. Because I didn't think it was that low of a pitch. If he reaches out, he might be able to save you. It was uh, It was kind of a low EFIS sort of change up. It didn't have a lot of velocity, oh, but I, it might have crossed the plate low at the knees. <laughs> it might have crossed the plate at the knees. Uh, That's a strike. <laughs> You're right, though. I was uh, I was ready to scamper oh, off that field and get out great. of the spotlight as <laughs> fast as possible. I said hi. 
Yeah. No yeah. one told me there was a picture, though. This was all going on behind my back. <laughs> and I did. Apparently, they were like, Ben, Ben, come back. Oh, my God. Yeah. Just can we get the game started, please? I, I, I got to say that our TV was on, and we don't go to commercial. So I got a chance to just, I laughed. I had a good chuckle on that one. That was good. <laughs> All right. Uh, I don't know if you uh, you guys saw. You probably did. I know um, Annie and, and Craig were talking about uh, the Juan Soto story in The Athletic. And I wanted to see if you guys had some just uh, more thoughts for the roundtable here of just, just some of the observations that were made by Britt Giroli in The Athletic about maybe Juan Soto's not connecting as well with the Padres, when he came over here, the efforts, the Padres, Tony, I don't know what you saw. It sounds like the Padres tried really hard behind the scenes to make Juan Soto feel comfortable and connected. And it never totally happened while he was here yet. He still was very productive, had a really good 2023 season statistically, individually. What did you make of, of any of those observations from that piece? To be fair, I haven't read the okay. article yet, but you know, from what I gather, um, I know the Padres did make a ton of efforts and I know that outside of, you know, of this, of Petco park, it sounded like he really wanted to stay. He didn't really necessarily want to be traded. I think he was kind of over the whole trade thing and having to start uh, from scratch again. Um, I, I think it's clear. And I think Nelson Cruz kind of made mention to this that, you know, his his the way he his his drive can can kind of turn him off towards teammates, which he said Nelson Cruz is why he thinks he'll fit perfectly in that in that New York setting. And, and so, listen, I think ultimately what matters is the Padres couldn't afford to bring yeah. him back, which is why they made the move they made. I I'm almost positive AJ Preller. That was not an easy thing for him to to move Soto, but when the time came, they had to make the move. He made the right move, and um, I, I think you know sometimes pieces just don't fit. We were just talking about the shuffling of the lineups. I mean, part of the reason why you could shuffle that lineup is because Soto could really hit anywhere. Manny can hit a bunch of different spots, and as a manager, when things aren't working, it's so tempting to start moving these pieces around to see how you can get something going. But I just think ultimately it was best for both pieces, right? Juan gets to move on to a place where he's probably got a chance to sign a, a lucrative extension. Um, the Padres get some relief financially and are able to bring in pieces and flip another piece together. I mean, so they, they've they both sides so far, it's worked out for it. Chris, part of me tell, says this is the biggest non-story ever. If the Padres find a way to win a couple of one-run games 100%. and make the playoffs, no one is talking about Juan Soto's lack of connection with the team. They're just enjoying a great run and, and maybe a postseason run. Is there anything to any of this in your mind? <laughs> Tony knows that I'm not wait to answer. No, Tony knows I'm not the world's biggest Juan Soto fan, and I, I never was for a lot of the reasons that were in the article. Um, but those are all things that I perceived. I always felt that Juan Soto was a little disconnected from this team. So that was just a, a, an assumption I made from watching from afar. Um, so when they traded him, I felt like it's a little bit addition by subtraction. Um, I think Juan Soto gets a better spot for him in New York in the limelight with all of the big media and all of that. And the Padres can go do their thing here in San Diego. I, it's unfair of me to be any more critical than that article is. Cause I truly don't know. I mean, I'm not in the, in the clubhouse every day with these guys. Um, but I, you know, Juan Soto is an amazing talent. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of his, uh, his work in the field or on the base pass. I mentioned it many times on the show. Yeah, great year. And I used right now. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> He's doing everything right now. But anyway, I it's, like a gold it, it's a hard argument to make. I know. All right. Sure. <laughs> it's sure. it's a hard argument to make that I'm not that Juan Soto isn't my, you know, all-time favorite baseball player because statistically he's uh, he's through the roof, but I th I think the Padres have, can get along fine without him. I do think it's a bit unfair and I'm not saying you're doing it. I just in general to be like all of this lies on Soto or Paul Melvin or whatever. Like it's, it's no, everyone in there is a big boy. They're, yeah. they're men. They have responsibility for their own actions in there and how they're going to play the game and show up to, to um, the facility every single day. 
there were rumblings at times of Soto being his own kind of guy, you know, having his own routines and things that he liked to do. But there were also those for other guys as well. And for Soto, like he, maybe he put the AirPods in during meetings or things like that. I'm not sure how detrimental that might be um, in terms of like a team meeting or a hitters meeting or things like that. But he also got on base. He also helped his team by producing. And so I think that there's something to be said about that as well. But I, I wouldn't sit here and be like, this is all Juan Soto's fault. T Tony, did you ever see players tune out coaches during a meeting because they oh, didn't want to hear what they were saying i haven't seen them put air <laughs> airpods in that's that's a that's on another level you didn't want to be affected by certain tells the, I, listen, I, I, okay I, it, it, players definitely <laughs> i mean i've i played in the air before airpods so i'm sure if there were some around there would have <laughs> definitely been in, in some guys ears it, it happens and um how do you how do you go about blocking that out without being disrespectful because that yeah. ultimately can come off not only to whoever's delivering the message, but the rest of the teammates that are out there. But yeah, I don't, I wasn't there for it. So I, it's hard for me to speak. Craig on. is part of this narrative self-serving for the Padres. Of course that, Hey, if Juan Soto wasn't the problem, then maybe the problem's still here. And no one wants to think that the problem is still sitting somewhere <laughs> in the clubhouse. So does this serve the Padres well to just, whether it's true or not, what Chris said, maybe Juan Soto wasn't connecting and, and now the team is better off without him. I think that it's not just the Padres. I want to be clear about that. Every team that's in a sticky situation and a player leaves and it's a little bit political, there comes out a story with unnamed sources all the time. All the time. That, that help soften the blow, make the departing team look a little bit better and make the player look a little bit worse. I think all of that happened in Richard Rowley's story. And I think the pod, the, the sources, whoever they might've been, uh, got the job done because here we are, we're all talking <laughs> uh, about this, right? What I took from that article more than anything else was that Juan Soto was never going to sign here. He, he wanted to be on the East coast. He prefers being on the East coast. It's much closer to the Dominican. It's much closer to his family. He wants to make that choice and he wants to be the highest paid player in Major League Baseball, he wants to match or beat Otani's contract without deferrals. It's right there in the story. It, it, his intent is spelled out directly. That's a, that's a shot across the bow to all 30 teams out there. You will be getting no discounts or money cut off. I want Correct. all my chips mm -hmm. up front. He does. And, and he's going to earn that deal. What I, Where I agree with Chris completely is that there was a disconnection last year. And however you want to say it's this guy, it's that guy, it's another guy. That was a disconnected team. Disconnected teams don't win. They don't win. I have been around plenty of championship teams that had less talent but were connected. And I've been around great teams that had more talent than everyone but were disconnected and found a way to lose. And that connection is the thing that I think Mike Schilt has brought. But I think that culture has come from the leaders of the team. I think Joe Musgrove made explicit mention of it yesterday. And we said, we've got a closer that will get us four or five outs. And we need that around here. He said that we need that around here. Those were his words. So I oh think boy. this is a team now that is more Chris, like everyone for each other I hope so. and, and less of what we saw last year, which kind of felt like a bunch of expensive pieces. The nine musketeers all for one and, and one for all. It's our 97, three, the five pan, the, there's a flub. 97.3 The Fan Padres Roundtable Mark presented by San Diego Roundtable Pizza. So I've saved the last quarter of the program for one last issue and question. And that is, what can A.J. Preller do? Assuming, as we've all kind of read, they're trying to stay under the luxury tax threshold. And they've got reportedly around, what, 12 to $14 million before they get that level. There are still free agents out there. The name Tommy Pham, Brandon Belt has been brought out. But we also saw a piece in The Athletic that came out that AJ has targeted Luis Arias of the Miami Marlins, who He's makes kicking tires 10 again. million. He's made <laughs> offers. It hasn't happened yet. Annie, let's start with you. If there's one last move that can be made, what are you doing if you're AJ Preller to the final piece of perhaps the puzzle here? Oh. 
I think that if you're able to bring in another hitter, it certainly can't hurt. If you're able to bring in another lefty, I can't imagine that that would hurt either. But a veteran guy who's got experience, who has been in a lot of situations in Major League Baseball that can help a team and just give the other guys then more depth. I mean, really what it's doing is, is yeah, maybe someone's going to disappear for a while or be sent down or whatnot. But it's giving you more depth, more more time. It's essentially insurance, you know, a little bit of insurance. So um, I've always said, bring Tommy Pham in, but heck, okay, bring Brandon Bell, bring Luis Arise. I, I think any of them would work. You mentioned the lefty, uh, Jesus Luzardo's name also coming up as, as a potential target for the Padres. And obviously the prospect cost to get one or both of those right. would be very high. Uh, for the San Diego Padres to attack. But could this be a reason why the Padres haven't made a move yet? That if they spend that money on Tommy Pham or they spend it on Brandon Bell, then they can't even make that offer and and go over the, the luxury tax. Is there some patience at play here? I think so. And they've shown patience. AJ Preller has shown more patience, I think, this offseason than, than we've seen in a while. Um, and he's had to show patience because the, the financials are different for this team. If he does go out and spend a lot of money, and I know you're talking prospects, but say you spend more money, you've got to leave yourself a little bit of a buffer under that, that CBT for the uh, trade deadline if your team is is in it and everyone hopes the Padres are in it and they're picking up pieces right there. I'm sorry. This chat is wild. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. Do you ever watch the chat? I have. This is the first time I've ever seen it going. We probably need to stop watching the chat. You'd be amazed at our chat in the morning, Tony. It would be wild. It would knock your socks off. That's for sure. You know what would be a good bit is if you went down and you kind of didn't, you know. Didn't you can comment in there too. Yeah, you comment, are you right, right or are you wrong? No, nah, I'm um, staying out that far. Yeah, I, <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, I don't know. I don't know that you can give up a lot of those. I mean, look, prospects are always commodities, right? But I'm not sure how much it would take for Luis Arise or to make that kind of. Thing. I'm going to hold off on Tony for a second because I know he's got some thoughts here. Craig, are you willing to give up any of the top five prospects in a deal for either Luis Arise or Jesus Lazardo? And we're talking about. I mean, no one wants to give up Salas. Right. Or no one will give up Salas. I, I mean, he's he's Period. as untouchable as any prospect that we've seen. Absolutely. Here, uh, it seems pretty pretty early to give up Leo Debris as well. <laughs> uh, but Snelling and Lesko, I think they're the kind of the coveted, but still maybe available, maybe not guys that would be targeted. You know, for this is how I want to answer that, which is to not answer it. Um, Luis Arias in terms of expected future war for the next two years is less than Dylan Cease. I think the price to get someone like Luis Arias is less than Dylan Cease. So if when I see people writing, oh, it's Snelling and Lesko and Head and, and DeVries for, for Arias, no way, no way. He's a singles hitting infielder with very limited defensive value. Okay, so the price won't be that high. Is is the Would they have to give up one? Maybe. Would I want to do it? Probably not. Having said that, I'm curious what you think. I yeah, here. because I mean, because there's because. no hitter in baseball oh, yeah, who yeah. is more right. like your dad right now, I would say, than I Luis Arise. Like, yeah. it's close to the perfect player for Petco Parkers I've ever seen. I, I think so, too. I think so, too. I, I just I have questions of fit. I mean, offensively, he fits. But where are you playing him? I mean, right. D.H.? Left field. Left, he did play. He some did play left some field. left field. Yeah, I mean, I'm just saying, like, is it insurance if Hassan Kim leaves as a free agent next year, and then he can play second, or Jake can play second? He's played some first. Yeah. I feel like field? this is kind of going back down the, the path of having too much to be able to to put. In. I think of all the three you guys name as much as I love Luis, and God knows I'd love to watch a hitter like that on an everyday basis. There's no doubt. Tommy's probably the one that fits the best. Right. I mean, I know he's right handed, but he certainly can play left field. He can certainly platoon. You can use him however you want to. I think in that clubhouse, you need somebody like yeah. that's a, a a dog in a good way. And I think he fits that mold. He, he definitely isn't going to let things slide in there that, you know, mm -hmm. perhaps slid in there last year. There's there's going to be some tough conversations mm -hmm. when he's in your locker room. But I think yeah. in terms of fit. You know, for me, Brandon Belt doesn't do it for me. He, he plays first base. I know he's dabbled in the outfield, but he's not a good outfielder. Um, you already have a new center fielder. You have a platinum winner on the right side. 
I just don't think you want to lose anything defensively because if what you say is true at the beginning, that this team's identity is going to be right. around defense and pitching, you certainly don't want to take away from what you already have. So I love I can't I gotta emphasize this again. I would love to watch Luis Arias on an everyday basis. Unless it's DH, just don't see how he fits. Now he's a two-time defending batting champion, but yes. it doesn't mean He's going to do it again this year as well. He's off to a bit of a slow start. It's not start. even the it's, batting champion, so it's the consistency it, I get of it. what he does. I get it. Adam Frazier looked pretty good for the Pirates. Oh, it's not the same. It's not the same as Adam Frazier. Luis Arias is not Adam Frazier. I know. I'm taking poor Elo here. You're, I'm, I feel like I'm going to throw it No, throw we've it got time. We're going to get time. I just agree. Like, like having that presence in the clubhouse, people think, oh, Tommy's intense. Tom, like, Tommy yes, holds you accountable. Intense. He's intense. He will rub you the wrong way but, if you're doing something that warrants it. But then he will bring everybody in in terms of preparation and things like that. Mike and, Shield, again, yeah. had him. Help bring him up. Help develop him. Right. Like, there's nobody who probably knows Tommy as well as Mike Shield. So I just, out of those guys, I, I like Tommy the most. I agree. Chris, what about you? Where would you uh, spend your last uh, nickel or your last prospect here to to finish off this team. He's my partner, isn't he? <laughs> Tony Gwynn Jr. Hit it on the head. Uh, first of all, Luis Arise would mess everything up. <laughs> I, I just, uh, where are you going to play him? Uh, again, like Tony said, you put him in the infield where he's best. Who's going to go play the outfield? The Padres need a left fielder, an everyday left fielder. I think Jerkson's a great fourth outfielder. I don't think he's an everyday left fielder batting sixth for an entire 162 games. Tommy Pham is easily the best player that is available to fit this Padre club right now in the clubhouse on the field, right-handed or left-handed. I'm not a fan of Brandon belt either. I would go all out all in on Tommy fam. I, um, I will say that when Manny returns to third base, they need a DH though. Tyler Wade, an exciting player, but you're, you're losing more value by putting him at a DH. You're right. Uh, it's it's you know. a short-sighted thought because you're right. At some point, yeah. Manny does go go yeah. to third. You need a DH. And, and that's why I want Belt is okay. for that and, time. and quite honestly, any of those three would be a huge upgrade over what they're going to end up with at DH. If it's just Eggie or Graham Pauly or Tyler Wade on an interchangeable basis somewhere at the bottom of the order, and you can put in a, a Tommy Fam, a Brandon Belt, or a Luis Arias who's more of a – middle of the order or top of the order hitter, you're making the team better by acquiring any of those players. So ultimately, I'm going to be disappointed if at least one of those moves is not made with whatever remaining money they have. I don't know which one's going to be the right one. I think there's some good arguments for all of them. You know, the Tommy Pham argument was made. The Luis Arias argument was made. But Brandon Belt's the, the biggest argument. He had, a, he had a great offensive season last year. He's left-handed. He could be the DH. Just plug him right in. And he could solve a lot of your issues in your lineup construction as well. There's an argument for all three of those guys sure. right now. I just kind of hope the Padres end up with one of them before all is said and done, before someone else decides, you know what, we're desperate enough, we're going to go steal them. Because there's a, a bunch of other teams that have needs as well. Out there. And we saw the Giants do that, right? When they went and got Chapman and Snell, they they said, and when and when the Diamondbacks got Montgomery, they went and they found a player to help them that was out there on the market that changes the Padres playoff percentage. So I agree. And I'm not married to Brandon belt. I just look at him as a left-handed option. That could be your everyday DH and then a spell first baseman every once in a while. Right. Yeah. Uh, for, for your team, Tommy makes you locked into seven right-handed hitters a good portion of the time. Blue Jays made the playoffs with a seven right-handed batter lineup last year. It, it doesn't disqualify you as a team, but to get to your general point, and I think Chris agrees too, we're a hitter short. I said it going into the season, and I say it now. We're a hitter short. Yeah, there's a hole that needs to be filled somewhere, and uh, I think we've talked about who potentially can fill it. You know, I think, you know, I I don't want to pick on Jerkson. I really love this guy. I mean, Jerkson's he's one of my all-time favorite yeah. guys to be around. 424 on base percentage, by the yeah, way. He, so far, so good. He's a pro. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, he... he Pun intended. Is, it, and a farm. <laughs> <laughs> Pun intended. His, his value is what he brings to you on an everyday basis from an at-bat standpoint. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get a just throwaway at-bat, but... You know, as you get deeper in the season, you're going to need more. By the way, he's the most Tommy Fam like player they have. Yeah, he in, is in the lineup. He's intense. 
Everyone sees him smiling and think he's the friendly. Nice do yeah. not cross your no. profile. He's got an edge. He's competitive. <laughs> and he'll call out too. And I think the more, to Tony's point, you need some of those guys in there. You do. It, it helps out so much in terms of. It balances out the ecosystem. In he's already addressed the team clubhouse. once yeah. this year. I mean, it's like one week in. And, and Jerickson's the guy who feels like he needs to Shout say out something. Shout too. He got his 10 years the other day. That, yeah. So what does that mean? Just quickly to, we got a minute here. I That's, mean, that is, uh, that is the, the magic number for all pros. You, you max out pension wise. There's so many benefits. You get your gold card, which means you can walk into any stadium on any day, have a seat. Uh, it's, it's, it's a pretty sweet. They, it's uh, always a, like nice. a party. They have like a cake yeah, or some yeah. sort of it's celebration. A, a Anytime a guy gets their 10 years of service. What, 10% of guys day. get to that, I think? Yeah. How many years did you get? I got eight. Eight. Yeah, oh eight. man, can we get short. you back in there for a couple and more years? I have to be on the coaching <laughs> staff somewhere. <laughs> like, Some you know? broadcasting count? Yeah, nah, that doesn't count. It don't put you on the it don't count the broadcast. All right. Remember every Thursday you can catch us here uh, live first 10 to 11 a.m. on 97.3 the fan. It's our Padres round table presented by San Diego Round Table Pizza. Thanks to Braden Engineering today for Chris Ello, for Craig Elston, for Tony Gwynn, for Annie Heilbrunn. I'm Ben Higgins, San Diego's number one sports station, 97.3 The Fan. Catch you later.